Hi, everyone. My name is Eve. Thank you for being here. Um, and my capstone topic is water supply and energy, relationships between snowpack, streamflow, and hydropower in the Snake River watershed. My overarching motivation for this topic was looking at how climate-driven water scarcity should be influencing more energy decisions. And as I began to investigate energy in the West, I found that hydropower is really the backbone of power in the Northwest. Most of these plants were federally funded and built in the early to mid-1900s as the population exploded. Today, hydropower produced in the Columbia River watershed currently provides power to over 50% of the Pacific Northwest, including from 29 major hydroelectric plants on the Columbia River and its tributaries. Um, uh, this white outline is the Columbia River watershed. My study is focusing on the Snake River and its watershed. The Snake River is the largest tributary to the Columbia River, and the outline of the watershed is in purple on this map, and it represents the lower corner of this watershed. As you can see, most of the Snake River watershed is within Idaho, and most of Idaho is within the watershed. So you'll hear me focus a lot on Idaho throughout this presentation. Idaho itself has more than 100 hydropower plants, and it is the eighth largest hydropower producer in the country. 79% of its electricity consumed comes from renewable energies, 60% of which has historically been hydropower. However, in recent years, that number has dropped to 50% due to drought. Which begs the question, how reliable will that energy be in the future? That brings me to the climate. As with everywhere, the average temperature in Idaho is increasing. Since 1950, the average annual temperature has increased by almost two degrees Fahrenheit. Additionally, the precipitation is shifting. More precipitation is falling as rain rather than snow as it historically has done. The image on the right, yes, the right, <laughs> um, shows the distribution of declines in the ratio of precipitation falling as snow rather than rain, the darkest red representing declines of up to 15% already. The mountains in the watershed of in the Snake River watershed see between 40 to 70 days around freezing. 60% of the precipitation falls during the winter, and that number jumps to 80% if you include it, if you include November to May. Additionally, 30 to 60% of the year's largest storms occur during the freezing temperatures. So an increase of just a couple of degrees will cause a major shift in the precipitation of the largest storms falling as rain rather than snow. This has major impact, impacts for water supply. Snow has the handy benefit of storing water throughout the winter and releasing it through the spring and summer as it slowly melts. This is especially handy in this dry and arid region that, see, that often goes weeks without a single drop of precipitation. As the climate warms, I wanted to draw special attention to the most intensely felt regions. Although uniform warming is an issue, as you can see, the localized effects of extreme heat shown on the bottom of the number of extreme heat days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit is concentrated in the little U at the bottom of southern Idaho. That happens to lie directly over the Snake River and the Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer. Together, the river and the aquifer provide irrigation water to 60% of the state's agriculture. Extreme heat exacerbates water scarcity, both increasing water demand as well as increasing water loss through evaporation and evapotranspiration. This brings me to my research question. With climate change altering water supply, can we rely on the lower Snake River dams to continue to supply a significant portion of energy in the Northwest? In order to answer this question, I broke it down into two smaller questions. I first looked at how water supply in the Snake River watershed is changing, and then I looked at how modeled snow water equivalent variables could be used to estimate power production. My study area is the Snake River watershed, again, outlined in purple. I focused on the lower granite dam marked by the black star on the map. The lower granite dam is the furthest upstream of the four lower Snake River dams, which in turn are the largest federal hydropower plants on the Snake River. Since they are run of river dams and the, snake, and the lower granite is the furthest upstream, essentially all of the water that flows out of the lower granite dam flows into the subsequent three dams, making it the perfect representation of what's happening to the four dams as a whole. Additionally, I used observed data from USGS stream gauges, represented by the red dots throughout the watershed. I used stream gauges located on the Snake River and its tributaries. 
But throughout this presentation, I'll be showing images of the analyses done to the stream gauge located on the Snake River directly upstream from the dam. This gauge is downstream of all of the tributaries, again, providing the perfect picture of what's happening in the watershed as a whole. I also used power production data from the US Corps of Army Engineers, which is the operating body for the dam. And in addition to this observed data, I used a variable infiltration capacity hydrology model based off of a hindcast of a climate model. That is a lot of words to just say <laughs> that I used a computer model that measured energy and water fluxes on land and between the land and the atmosphere in order to model water supply. It'll become clearer later. The first step in this analysis was to establish the link between stream flow and power production. As you can see, stream flow on the Snake River is highly correlated with power production at the Lower Granite Dam in every month except for August. In August, the dam undergoes an operational shift as it prioritizes maintaining flows for fish migration rather than power production. I then looked at the annual cycles of stream flow and power production. And while I expected them to mirror each other, it is still shocking to see how little power is produced in August and the subsequent months. If you shift your eyes to the stream flow on the left, there are three lines. Blue represents the historical average that I calculated from 1960 to 1990. Red represents the recent average that I calculated from 1990 to 2020. And yellow is the total average from the length of the record. The biggest takeaway from this is looking at when peak stream flow occurs. In the historical average, it occurs in June while in the recent average, it consistently occurs in May. I then zoomed in to look at the interannual variability of stream flow in the seasons. As you can see, across every season, the recent average stream flow is lower than the historical average, although this discrepancy is felt most strongly in the fall. Looking at trends in total stream flow, I looked at the peak production of stream flow in every year, or the peak stream flow of every year, and while it varies greatly year to year, there isn't a ton of significant trends. I found four out of the nine gauges showed a significant declining trend, on the remaining five showed no trend. Looking at cumulative discharge at the end of the water year, the water year starts in October and ends in September. Across the board, I saw declines in six out of nine of the stream gauges, showing significant declining trends. While the peak stream flow is related to the volume of snow melting at once, Cumulative stream flow is related to the total water supply. I then shifted into the spring, as the peak stream flow seemed to be occurring in May and June. I looked at the fraction of stream flow occurring in May and found that it is steadily increasing, while the fraction of stream flow occurring in June is steadily declining. This represents a shift in the timing of water availability and is most likely caused by increased spring temperatures. This is supported by an analysis that I did, as well as everywhere in the literature. I then zoomed out to the VIC model in order to look at the watershed as a whole. So using the same time periods of 1960 to 1990 and 1990 onwards, um, I compared the recent averages from the historical averages, and I found across the board, while some areas are gaining snow and others are losing snow, more area is losing snow than gaining, as represented by the blue for losing and yellow for gaining. I then selected two specific years, 1974 and 1937. The Lower Granite Dam is operating procedures are based off of an 80-year climate average, and they use 1937 to represent minimum flows for operational capacity, and 1974 for maximum flows for operational capacity. This means that if stream flow dips below the levels that it was in 1937, they cannot continue to produce power at their baseload supply. And if it goes above, it doesn't mean that they can make more power. They've reached capacity. In 1974, there were anomalies of up to 31 extra inches of snow across the watershed, as well as in 1937, there are anomalies of up to almost 16 inches lower than average in the watershed. And this is uh, snow water equivalent, which is a measure of the amount of water contained in snow. The next step was correlating the VIC model with stream flow. And I found that the correlation varied both temporally and spatially, with the highest correlations occurring in the mountainous region of the watershed 
in the winter and spring. This makes sense, but it also further emphasizes the point that the snow that falls in the entire watershed directly impacts stream flow on the Snake River. Using the correlational coefficients from this analysis, I was able to estimate what the stream flow could be for the entire 99-year length of the VIC model timescale. I modeled that, and I overlaid that with observed stream flow, marked in red. As you can see, they align quite well. While there are some discrepancies, the peaks are located in the peaks, and the valleys are located in the valleys, indicating further that the snow year really dictates stream flow. I then used the correlational coefficients from the first graph I showed you between streamflow and power production in order to estimate what power production would have been throughout the 100-year timescale. I overlaid that with observed power. Um, and as you can see, a similar trend follows with the peaks in the peaks and the valleys in the valleys. I wanted to bring us back to 1937 levels marked by the black line. As you can see, in the past 80 years, we have reached or gone below the streamflow levels seen in 1937. Using the estimated power variables, I graphed what hydropower production would have been in 1937 and 1974, and I overlaid that with the observed average power production between 2001 and 2021. As you can see, our current annual production is much closer to the minimum level flows than it is to the maximum. Circling back to our research question, in order to answer with climate change altering water supply, can we rely on the lower Snake River dams? We looked at water supply in the Snake River watershed. We found that more area is losing snow than gaining snow. We found that there's a decreasing stream flow and shifts in timing of water availability to earlier in the year. We asked if modeled snow water equivalent variables are able to estimate power production, and we found that they kind of are. In order to answer the larger question, answer the larger question with climate change altering water supply, can we rely on the lower Snake River dams to continue to supply a significant portion of energy? The short answer is further research is needed. <laughs> But the long, and before I go into the long answer, I wanted to remind us why we went on this journey. This is a snapshot of the Bonneville Power Ad Administration's operating resources for 2021. The, the BPA is the operating marketing energy manager for um, federal power in the Northwest. 85% of their resources is hydropower. As we continue to decarbonize the grid, wind and solar are on the rise. They are expected to grow exponentially, as they should. We need it. However, those energy sources are variable and dependent upon daily weather. It is well known that we need a reliable energy source in order to balance the grid when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Many analysts have suggested that hydropower can provide that service in the Northwest. However, we have found that power generation is variable and highly dependent upon the local water supply, which in the West is historically snow. We have found that our current power production is closer to the minimum flows than the maximum flows, and we have found that warming temperatures are increasing the length of the low power season. In order to answer this research question fully, more research is needed. However, luckily, I created this model using downscaled climate models, Hindcast, which is their runs for the previous 100 years. The next step in this research is to apply the forecast of the next 100 years of snow water equivalent values in order to estimate power production until 2100. Additionally, it would be important to break down the data to a finer scale. Mountain topography is complex, and the localized climate is highly dependent upon that specific mountain valley or mountain peak. The role of climate drivers, such as El Nino and Pacific Decadal Oscillation, are well known to have major effects on western water and temperature, um, and so investigating their role in these trends would also be imperative. And finally, the Lower Granite Dam is only one power plant in the larger system of the Northwest Power System. It's important to take this analysis further and look at the whole, every single piece of the puzzle. I wanted to give a major thank you to my entire capstone committee, especially Dr. Mark Merrifield, my committee chair. I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to work with the amazing researchers at Scripps, Mark, as well as Dan, 
And I'm also grateful to have had the chance to work with Idaho Conservation League with Mitch Cutter and Nathan Welch over at the Nature Conservancy. Also, thank you to the CSP cohort, Corey, Hannah, my friends, family. You guys are all my cheerleaders. Thank you. Any questions? Um, for the sort of historical records, um, is there is that the same methodology used to collect that data over time, or has it become uh, like more fine over time? I guess for the stream gauge data, mm -hmm. um, I believe it's the same method that's been used. The same stream gauge sites over time have been added, like additional measurements like temperature and pH and like oxygen content, but just the rate of flow has been consistent. So I don't know a bunch of, about dams, but I know that most of them were constructed a long time ago. Um, is there any talk about how they could become more efficient to still make hydropower with lower stream flow? I believe that there is some talk of that, although most of the talk is dominated by how expensive they are, the repairs that need to be done because they are built a long time ago. And actually, the four Lower Snake River dams have been recommended to be removed um, because of their contribution to declines in salmon population. Although in order to proceed with that, um, the, this major source of energy needs to have another source. So it's all part of the puzzle. Cool. Thanks, guys.